I know what you're thinking. Just what does Bruce Willis and Live Free or Die Hard have to do with Asian news? Stick around. I promise I will get to it. This is Asian News Weekly, the podcast featuring news commentary and analysis from the Asia Pacific region. Pundits continue to express worry about Thailand's Article 44. Is Malaysia stepping away from reform? And President Obama talks tough by issuing new cyber hacking penalties. These stories and more are on the April 10th edition of Asia News Weekly. Hello, everyone. Welcome once more to the Friday podcast. My name is Steve Miller, and it is my pleasure to be here with you today. Our first story this week is from Thailand. Now, on last week's podcast, I mentioned Thailand's prime minister, Prayu Chanacha, had lifted martial law and invoked Article 44 of the Interim Charter. Now, since the announcement, there has been a steady stream of criticism. Reporters Without Borders' Benjamin Ishmael said, It is of grave concern that the Thai army is carrying out a change of government. Instead of government by rule of law, the junta is in charge, governing by force, under the pretext of guaranteeing public order. The army aims to censor all criticism of the military and to discourage the press from freely expressing opinions. The military must stop the repeated violations of freedom of information, that have been underway since they took power. All of that sounds very dire, but then you get to hear statements like these and you can't help but to agree. I will shut them down only when they don't say good things. I have not yet shut down any publications, but please write in a good way. If it is not good, then I will need to do that, said Prime Minister Prayut. He also said, if anyone says anything that causes damage to the Royal Thai Army or the country, I will not stand for it. I am not scared. Thailand currently ranks 130th out of 180 nations in the 2014 Reporters Without Borders Press Freedom Index. So it's no wonder the Foreign Correspondents Club of Thailand released this statement on the issue. The professional membership of the Foreign Correspondents Club of Thailand, the FCCT, shares the concern expressed by four Thai media organizations over the new edict announced by the NCPO under Article 44, as outlined in the following report posted on the 2nd of April on the website of broadcaster Thai PBS. The new order gives military officers sweeping powers to censor the media, with harsh punishments possible for journalists deemed not to be in compliance. We join these organizations in urging the authorities to offer clear guidelines on how they will handle reports they consider problematic. We also hope that all news organizations, both foreign and domestic, covering Thailand's complex and divisive politics will strive for objectivity, fairness, and accuracy at all times. These organizations must be given proper credit for making such efforts and not have their reports misrepresented by any party. Now, to deflect some of this criticism, the government replied directly to the critics. Deputy Prime Minister Wisanu Kriyanam told foreigners may perceive this issue differently from Thais, as they're looking at it from another perspective. Thais had experienced this kind of draconian law over several episodes, although the younger generation was not familiar with it. Article 44 may surprise foreigners, because they have never seen this kind of law before, especially when they see that it is applied to different issues. Article 44, however, cannot be applied to harm anybody until it is used. If we compare Article 44 to a sword, it's like keeping it in its scabbard and wielding it only when necessary. In fact, Wissanu noted this was the sixth such time something like this article had been employed. He also likened it to the French Constitution, However, it isn't anything like that. So let's take a look at how this sword could be wielded. The I-Law, the Freedom of Expression Documentation Center, translated the order. A portion of the provision read, Peacekeeping officers are empowered to issue orders prohibiting the propagation of any item of news or the sale or distribution of any book or publication or material 
likely to cause public harm or which contains false information likely to cause public misunderstanding to the detriment of national security or public order. The UN Commissioner for Human Rights, Zid Ra'ad al-Hussein, didn't hold back any punches. Normally, I would warmly welcome the lifting of martial law, but I'm alarmed at the decision to replace martial law with something even more draconian, which bestows unlimited powers on the current Prime Minister without any judicial oversight at all. Aside from the disruptions in the southern regions of Thailand, things across the nation are relatively calm. There's absolutely no need for the heavy-handedness we're seeing. But even in the southern regions of Thailand, we're seeing disturbing events. Soldiers conducted a warrantless search at about 5 a.m. on the 2nd of April at four student dormitories in the Muang district of Naratiwat province. They also forced at least 17 activists from the network of ethnic Malay Muslim students at the Princess of Naratiwa University to give DNA samples and then took them into military custody. The military authorities have provided no explanation for the students' detention or said when they would be released. Brad Adams, Human Rights Watch Asia director, said, Arbitrary arrests, secret detention, and unaccountable officials are a recipe for human rights abuses. And it's that last statement that is key. We're entering a new phase where there is absolutely no check on Prime Minister Prayut's power. He has it all. He has absolute control. And while the day-to-day -day situation, the day-to-day -day living environments for those in Thailand have largely remained unchanged since the coup, it's that slow addition of power Prayut is accumulating that is of real concern. Lord Acton said, Power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Prayut initiated the coup to reform the government, and he is succeeding. The only thing remains is to see which direction that reform is ultimately going. Now, to Prayut's credit, he will be inviting specialists from Germany and France to review the draft constitution. He's bringing in outside experts. And this is something I have been advocating for months now. Where it goes from here, we just have to wait and see. Now, coming up later in the podcast, what Obama's new executive order really means. Earlier this week, Malaysia enacted a new anti-terror law that was condemned by many. Phil Robertson, Deputy Director of Human Rights Watch's Asia Division, said, The passage of this law is a giant step backwards for human rights in Malaysia that fundamentally calls into question the government's commitment to basic rights that are critical to the rule of law in a functioning democracy by stripping accused persons of the right to trial in a court, access to legal counsel, and other legal protections if they are accused under the very broad provisions of this law, the government is continuing its slide into rights-abusing rule. By restoring indefinite detention without trial, Malaysia has reopened Pandora's box for politically motivated, abusive state actions that many had thought was closed when the Abusive Internal Security Act was revoked in 2012. Passage of this legislation raises serious concerns that Malaysia will return to practices of the past when government agents frequently used fear of indefinite detention to intimidate and silence outspoken critics. However, that is only the tip of the iceberg of what is really going on in Malaysia, and perhaps what is even more troubling is the nation's sedition law. Now, before we go much further, we really need to define sedition, and that is this conduct or speech inciting people to rebel against the authority of a state or monarch. But the government in Malaysia takes that to the extreme. Last Friday, Zukifli Anwar Ulhaki, also known as Lunar Online, was arrested on nine counts under the nation's sedition laws. He posted a series of tweets commenting on Anwar Ibrahim's sodomy conviction and commenting on the conduct of the judiciary. Now, according to his lawyer, no one in Malaysia has ever been charged with nine counts of sedition. No one. And if found guilty, he could find himself behind bars for more than 40 years. Over a cartoon. 
Zukifli received one sedition charge for each tweet. He said, why do they want to charge me nine times? They could just do one. For me, if you ask me, this is just to punish me before the trial. Other targets of the Sedition Act are Nurul Iza Anwar, the daughter of jailed opposition leader Anwar Ibrahim. Her arrest prompted the U.S. State Department to express concern over the freedom of expression in Malaysia. She was eventually released. Lawyer Michelle Yazudas is also being investigated after tweeting, You know why bail exists? Because the system knows that when the person hasn't been found guilty, so there is no legitimacy in their imprisonment. She then commented by saying, Somehow, I feel as if they want us not to feel safe for airing our views anymore on social media. Imagine living in a country where you are absolutely too scared to share your opinion. What's at the heart of this matter are two new provisions in the 2015 Sedition Law. Section 5A states that if there is a certificate in writing by the public prosecutor saying it is not in the public interest to grant bail to the person charged under subsection 41A, no bail will be granted. Section 5B states that the court will have the power to prevent those who are charged and released on bail under section 4 from leaving the country by ordering them to surrender their travel documents for a certain period. In fact, Prime Minister Najib had promised to abolish the Sedition Act in 2011, but last year he said the law would be retained and strengthened. Now, to the Prime Minister's credit, Section 31C was deleted, therefore decriminalizing criticism of Malaysia's administration of justice. But if we step back and take a look at what's really taking place in Malaysia, we use the lunar case as an example. Absolutely none of it has to do with the textbook example, the textbook definition of what sedition truly is. And coming up in just a few minutes, another top Chinese official is snared by Xi Jinping. Even as military forces engage in battles in the Middle East and Africa against terrorist organizations like the Islamic State and Boko Haram, the question remains, what are governments going to do? How are they going to respond to an ever-increasing amount of cyber attacks? Many of the headlines today detail successful infiltrations into systems with debilitating results. Lillian Ablon of the Rand Corporation. There are distinctions in the types of cyber actors and cyber threats and who their targets are. So a lot of the times we say, boy, there's a lot of cyber attacks happening, um, but they're very different. Um, the actors going after these attacks are different. Um, their motivations are different. And so even though we see something like Sony happening, I might not need to be as concerned about something like a Sony happening as I do a target happening. So roughly there are uh, four different kinds of cyber threat actors, state-sponsored actors, cyber criminals, hacktivists, and then cyber terrorists. So as of late, what are some of the greatest hacks on record? South Korea's nuclear plant plans have been stolen. Its banking and broadcasting networks have also been disrupted. If we take a look at the worldwide stage, nearly $1 billion have been stolen from banks around the globe. Sony Pictures' private information has been leached. In addition, Sony's PlayStation Network has been disrupted. If we turn to China, even Google's China's corporate servers have been infiltrated. British security services were hacked in 2008, and Al-Qaeda's terror network data was swiped. And of course, Chinese hacking of various U.S. business systems. So why am I bringing this up now? Well, U.S. President Barack Obama signed a new executive order last week, giving the government power to go after cyber criminals. Officially, it's called blocking the property of certain persons engaging in significant malicious cyber-enabled activities. The new order allows sanctions against foreigners implicated in cyber attacks against U.S.-based targets. It allows the United States to punish any person determined to have engaged in, directly or indirectly, cyber-enabled activities originating from or directed by persons located in whole or in substantial part outside the United States 
that are responsibly likely to result in or have materially contributed to a significant threat to the national security, foreign policy, or economic health or financial stability of the United States. Okay, so what does all that mumbo jumbo mean? It means the United States is going to freeze your assets. It's going to take your money. And more importantly, it's going to take your travel documents and prevent you from leaving the country. But here's what would need to happen to set things in motion. There are four key factors. Harming or otherwise significantly compromising the provision of services by a computer or network of computers that support one or more entities in a critical infrastructure sector. Significantly compromising the provision of services by one or more entities in a critical infrastructure sector. Causing a significant disruption to the availability of a computer or network of computers. Or causing a significant misappropriation of funds or economic resources trade secrets, personal identifiers, or financial information for commercial or competitive advantage or private financial gain. Now that's great legalese speak, but it only targets individuals, not states. I doubt this is going to change the behavior of primary American cyber adversaries, Russia and China, because the credibility and comparative scale of retaliatory sanctions is too small, said Ian Bremmer, president of Eurasia Group, in a message to the Business Insider. And he's absolutely right. This is a good step, and it could be used against individuals or private entities like companies. But it does little to deter state-level actors. They simply have too much power. I mean, if we look at the United States and those five Chinese officials that are being held for hacking into U.S. computer systems, so what if their assets are frozen? When they do get out, China has the resources to more than make up for it. Plus, it does little to thwart a state-level attack. In fact, recently GitHub, the home of the Chinese language version of the New York Times and GreatFire.org, were hit with a massive DDoS attack. It was perhaps the result of millions of computers worldwide infected by malicious code possibly installed from China's major search engine, Baidu. GitHub said in a statement, We believe the intent of this attack was to convince us to remove a specific class of content. Meaning, they just didn't want to block the site. They wanted the sites removed. Which brings us to the idea of a fire sale. What's a fire sale? It's a three-step. It's a three-step systematic attack on the entire national infrastructure. Okay, step one, take out all the transportation. Step two, the financial base and telecoms. Step three, get rid of all the utilities, gas, water, electric, nuclear, pretty much anything that's run by computers, which, which today is almost everything. So that's why they call it a fire sale, because everything must go. Okay, I know the situation is fictional, but think about it. We have so far seen successful hacks in the financial sector in the communication sector, and in the energy sector. Chinese firms aren't backing down, and they are stealing critical intellectual property from various U.S. companies. Yes, Obama's actions have earned the wrath of China and caused some problems for U.S. companies operating inside the PRC, but we are entering an age where nations can hide behind a digital veil, where they can carry out operations detrimental to their targets. The United States is simply the first nation to say openly what it's going to do and offer some clues to what pretty much every nation around the globe is doing behind the scenes. As Ablon said, we are seeing more attacks. And in my opinion, they're going to get bolder and they're going to get more destructive. And eventually, all these countries around the globe are going to take full advantage of those cyber command facilities popping up in each of their respective military branches. This week, it was even announced that the White House was hacked by Russian operatives and sensitive data was stolen. Powerful nations may be hesitant to initiate large-scale physical combat operations because they're simply too politically unpopular. But if you can inflict 
damage from behind a computer screen. That makes things so easy. So what does this all really mean? The attacks we're seeing now is only the beginning. The response the United States has made public is also only the beginning. The only pathway now is escalation. Last Friday, Chinese President Xi Jinping managed to cage another rogue tiger. Zhou Yong Kang, China's former security chief, was charged last Friday with bribery, abuse of power, and disclosing state secrets. Zhou is the most prominent individual charged under Xi Jinping's anti-corruption probe. This indictment read in part, The defendant Zhou Yong Kang took advantage of his posts to seek gains for others and illegally took huge property and assets from others, abused his power, causing huge losses to public property and the interests of the state and the people. The social impact is vile, and the circumstances were extraordinarily severe, intentionally leaked secrets. Zhou was in his position until 2012. He headed the Ministry of Public Security. A formal probe into his activities was launched in July of 2014. After he was arrested, news outlets branded him a traitor. Zhao's other allies have also fallen. Since they all have roots in the oil industry, they've been dubbed the Petroleum Gang. The trial is set to take place in Tianjin, presumably in an effort to promote some transparency in the case and allow him the opportunity to appeal to a higher court. Willie Lam, a longtime China observer, said, The only surprise, perhaps, is that they've made no reference to his son or his other relatives, as well as his cronies and former colleagues numbering in perhaps more than 100 people, who are also members of the corruption gang led by Zhao Yongkang. Zhang Lifan noted that the charges also omitted a coup Zhou allegedly took part in. He noted, The most serious crime he's been charged with, the leaking of state secrets, seems to refer to the possibility that he leaked information to Bao Zhilai. Zhou happens to be the highest-ranking Chinese official to be charged since the Cultural Revolution. Think about that. Since the Cultural Revolution. Unfortunately, we may never know what happens behind those closed doors of the trial. And analysts say, given the severity of the charges themselves and the fact that investigators are going back some 20 years, Zhou could face the death penalty. We all know that Xi Jinping is very serious about fighting graft or at least securing his place in power. And the fact that he's going back some 20 years in this particular case is proof of that. All that remains to be seen now is where the purge ends. And coming up tomorrow on the Asia Now podcast, Bitcoins, just what are they and do they have a place in our future? All right, well, here is another quick look at some of the other stories taking place in the region you may have missed. Last week, China expressed thanks to Sri Lanka for stating it would most likely not grant a visa to the Dalai Lama. Sri Lankan Buddhist monks invited the Dalai Lama after a pro-China government was voted out of office. China has tried to use its economic power to influence countries from meeting with the Dalai Lama, but only a few nations have caved. China offered Sri Lanka over $1 billion in grants, showing in this instance, money talks. Next week marks the one-year anniversary of the sinking of the South Korean ferry Sewol. It's a disaster that still scars the nation. This week, South Korean President Park Geun-hye promised to look into raising the vessel that claimed more than 300 lives. At a briefing on Wednesday, the Ministry of Oceans and Fisheries said the salvage operation, if approved, would cost about 120 billion won, which is about 110 million U.S. dollars. Senior Ministry official Yeon Yong Jin clarified that this was only an estimate and the final cost could be dependent on weather conditions and other factors. Six people were hospitalized following an explosion at a petrochemical plant in Zhangzhou, southern China. Hundreds of firefighters were dispatched on April 7th to suppress the blaze. The plant manufactures paraxylene, or PX, a chemical used for producing fibers and plastics. Chinese police have expanded their investigation into five women they arrested on International Women's Day. According to their lawyers, 
Authorities are now looking into their campaigns against domestic violence and for more public toilets for women. The initial reason for taking them away was the anti-sexual harassment bus activity on March 7th. But it looks like slapping them now with a criminal charge for that is obviously very difficult, said Wang Man, one of the women's supporters. The United States, the United Kingdom, and the European Union condemned the detentions, prompting China to call for other nations to respect its sovereignty. And finally, Saitama Prefecture, north of Tokyo, has created a police forensics team comprised of only female officers. This is being done to help lessen the stress of women involved in sex crimes. The prefecture has had more than 500 sex crimes in each of the past two years. And those are just some of the other stories taking place this week. On Sunday's Patreon-exclusive podcast, I'll have more. Well, my friends, the podcast is winding down. But before I go, let's take a quick look at some of your comments. First up, Red White Dude. Given China's past conduct, I would not be surprised if it became militarized maritime area. If Chinese seize the whole area, they will leave troops there to prevent others from taking it back. Wikipedia said, Such a powerful interview, speaking about the one with Sean Ahmed on Asia Now. Thank you so much for sharing. Elizabeth Seal added, He's one brave Muslim to openly admit he is gay. He has my respect. Matthew Nolan chimed in about Japan needing 800 Tomahawk missiles. China is banking on carrier-killing missiles in lieu of a modern navy. On the same subject, at Neve W on Twitter said, China actually got a lot of its nuclear reactor technology from Canada to build water reactors. Boggles my mind Canada would even help China. Turning to the ownership of either Dokdo or Takashima, depending on your point of view, Quad8 said, Another pointless debate that needs to go away but keeps getting dragged up to stoke people's egos. Thank you again to everyone who took time out this past week to leave comments on the podcast. I truly do value them. And I hope you'll take a moment again this week to share your thoughts, whether it be in the comment section, on Facebook, or Twitter. To keep up with more news from the region, follow Asian News Weekly on Facebook or Twitter. You can even send an email to the show with your questions, your comments, and your feedback. That email address is podcast at asiannewsweekly.net. If you enjoyed today's program, please share it with your friends. And if you haven't, subscribe. It's absolutely free and easy to do. Just go to our website, asiannewsweekly.net, and click the subscribe tab. Or you can do it inside your favorite podcast application like iTunes or Stitcher. Well, my friends, that's it for me this week. Thank you so much for joining me. Until next time, my name is Steve Miller, reminding you to be true to yourself and to always be awesome.